Dead bodies will continue to be transformed into the flesh-eating ghouls. Hello, and welcome back to Pathophysiology Living Dead. I'm Spooky Bill. Oh, spooky <laughs> Bill's a wanker. Spooky hey, Bill's a wanker. Back it off, for all, uh, Zap ya. He is like a mounty. He always gets his man. And he'll zap you any way he can. Zap. As I was saying, I'm Spooky Bill, and in this episode, and, well, the next few episodes, we are going to step outside the body and discuss the pathogens that have been suggested to cause the uh, zombie plague. Now this episode we're going to focus mainly on viruses. Well, because it's come to my attention that not everybody really understands what a virus is. And, well, not to single anybody out. You have no idea what it is, do you? It could be microbial, viral, parasitic, mm. fungal. Or the wrath of God. There's that. Now I'm just a nurse, not a CDC doctor, but I can tell you that this is a virus. And probably by the end of the show you'll be able to see that that's a virus as well. Now, it's not just limited to fiction television. Um, I was watching local news recently, and they had a medical doctor on who called MRSA a virus. He said the MRSA virus. Now I'm sure he just misspoke it, but the news never had any retractions, and... You know, I'm sure it was viewed by many people that now think methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a bacteria, but they now think it's a virus because they saw it on the news by a doctor. So, you know, and, and the mistakes really, you know, I've even made a couple myself, you know, and we'll discuss that later. But, uh, yeah, nobody's perfect. So, what is a virus? Well, a virus is... Well, it's like a pig in a blanket, right? Or, or maybe a, a camper in a sleeping bag. Where the uh, pig or the camper is the uh, nucleic acid and the blanket or sleeping bag is the, uh, the lipid or carbohydrate envelope or even the, the protein capsid. Now, the nucleic acid, this is the bad stuff in a virus, right? This is the David to the cell's Goliath. Now, there's all types of nucleic acids in, in viruses. There's viruses with uh, double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, uh, negative sense single-stranded RNA, positive sense single-stranded RNA. There's even some... Uh, single-stranded RNA viruses that have a matching positive or negative sense in them to allow for self-alienating or putting itself together. Now, you also have retroviruses, single-stranded RNA and double-stranded DNA. Those we're going to talk about in the next episode. They're really cool. But what the nucleic acid does, right, it hijacks the cell's machinery. Our destination is Glasgow. There is no need to panic. <laughs> There's a bomb on board this plane. And instead of the cell producing the bits and pieces it needs for its own metabolism, its own reproduction, it now produces all the bits and pieces it needs to reproduce more copies of the virus. A virus walks into a bar. <laughs> the bartender says, we don't serve viruses in this bar. The virus replaces the bartender and says, now we do. <laughs> And it's for this reason that a cell is not considered alive. It's, it's actually right on the cusp of life. Uh, without a living cell, a virus will not survive. In 1991, researchers successfully created entire polioviruses in test tubes containing ground-up human cells, no living cells, and poliovirus RNA. About five hours later, they had living complete cells. So our definition of a cell being alive or not being alive is rapidly changing and something that <clears throat> a cell being able to infect a virus, sorry, and a virus being able to infect a cell that's not alive is monumental to the zombie's survival. Now let's move on to the lipid envelope. Um, now in the last episode, I stated that the envelope will help the virus survive outside the body, and I got to admit, I was wrong. I had it backwards. I was wrong. 
It, it's actually, it's the other way around. Naked viruses... Or viruses without a lipid envelope are more apt to survive outside of the human body and enveloped viruses are more susceptible to drying out um, a disinfectants. No, don't. However, uh, the hepatitis B virus can survive at least seven days outside the human body and it is enveloped. So, you know, just because a virus is enveloped doesn't mean that it's weaker um, outside the human body. I mean, seven days, that's quite a bit. Now, the capsid is comprised of protein subunits, uh, or capsimeres, that surround the nucleic acid. And often, the number and type of proteins can be used to identify the type of virus. Um, but this gives it its shape. It, it's kind of like... Introducing Buckyballs, the amazing magnetic toy you can't put down. Buckyballs are made of 216 powerful rare earth magnets that can do just about anything. Now let's move on to the envelope. Now some viruses will have an envelope, some viruses will only have a capsid, some will have both a capsid and an envelope. Now the envelope always surrounds the capsid, it's never the other way around. And this is because the envelope is formed as the virus is pushing out of the cell. And as it pushes out, it takes part of the cell membranes with it, and that forms the envelope. Now, as you may have noticed, some viruses have these spikes on the outside, and, and these are glycoproteins that are sort of like keys that help the virus attach to specific receptors uh, or locks on the host cell. Now, I mentioned before that envelope viruses are more susceptible to the elements, uh, higher low temperature, higher low pH, drying out, but what are their benefits? Well, because they're actually formed from the cell membrane, their similarity to that membrane allows them to uh, blend in and fool the immune system to thinking that they're actually part of the body. Also, right, these envelopes allow the virus to actually fuse to the cell where the cell and the virus become one. So that's your basic anatomy and function of a virus. Now it's important to remember that antibiotics will not kill a virus, right? They will only kill a bacteria. Some antivirals will work on viruses. They interrupt uh, certain phases in the viral replication, which is, right, attachment to the cell, uh, injecting its viral bits into the cell, those viral bits taking over the cell's machinery to make more viral bits, and then those viral bits putting themselves together and making viruses, then ejecting from the cell to create more vi uh, to infect more cells and create more viruses. Now as we've seen in previous episodes, the immune system is pretty amazing, but there are ways a virus can get around it. We've already discussed how you know, a virus can target specific cells in your immune system, but, well, they have other defenses, and one of the simplest is to rapidly shut down the host cell. By doing this, it suppresses uh, the production of cytokines, um, the production of MHC class 1 molecules. We've talked about that recently, too. Another simple defense is rapid reproduction, right? By reproducing rapidly, it allows the virus to go through several cycles of viral replication before uh, the immune system can be initiated. Um, the T4 phage can produce up to 200 copies of itself in about a half an hour. So that's pretty quick. Another way that a uh, virus can infect rapidly is by forming syncytia. Now HIV infects this way. What it does is one of the uh, viral proteins that the virus uses to enter the cell is then transported to the surface of the cell. So the infected cell now has this uh, attachment uh, protein on the surface of a cell and it allows that infected cell and cells around it to fuse together, thereby forming a cluster of cells all fused together 
all infected by a single virus. Other viruses will decrease or inhibit production of MHC class 1 molecules. Some adenoviruses produce a protein that binds the MHC class 1 molecule inside the cell, thereby inhibiting its expression on the surface of the cell. Um, however, this isn't foolproof, as we may have discussed, NK cells, natural killer cells, will target cells that do not express the MHC class 1 molecule. There are other viruses that will resist apoptosis, or programmed cell death. Uh, some adenoviruses are so efficient in this that they have to produce a protein called the adenovirus death protein, which causes cell death and then the release of the virus. Alright, I know what you're thinking. If a virus can prevent programmed cell death, can it cause cells to survive after death of the body? And I don't think so. Um, well, no. Because there's a difference between that and, and the cellular autolysis that occurs when there's no oxygen going to the body, which is what happens in death. But I do have another answer for that, for delayed decomposition, and I, I've got a pretty good, good theory on this, which we'll have to discuss later, we have to build up to it. Well, that's about it for now. In the next episode, we're going to talk about retroviruses, which are really cool. Um, we're also going to talk about how airborne viruses can infect you. If you'd like to see how a virus can infect through a bite, be sure to check out episode 3. Also, make sure you head over to the new website. That's potld.com. And make sure you head over to the Fear Inside. I'd also like to thank Johnny T. Uh, from Johnny T's cult film podcast and blog. Excellent blog. Hilarious podcast. Great group of guys there. Anyway, I'd like to thank them for writing a song in my honor. That's right. So check them out. Check out the Fear Inside. Check out potld.com. And as always, thank you for watching, and remember, stay spooky. Oh yeah, there's some cool shirts on the website too. Check those out. Spooky feels a wanker. <laughs> <laughs>